for you, Alison. I never know from one week to the next what I'm going to, to give, but I do read a lot of the Word, and I get inspired, as you get inspired when you read the Word, but I have to get inspired maybe in a little different way on a message to give out of the Word. And this was uh, one that uh, inspiration that came from this week. Habits of a growing Christian loving and living out biblical habits and principles of the Word of God. And it was interesting how this all came about. I remember a book in 1989 that was published called Seven Habits of Effective People. It was known as a, a book of, of 25 of the most influential books during that time that was ever written. 25, 25 of the most influential books at that time. And I, I even was thinking about doing something from the Word of biblical habits and practices of knowing God and serving God that help us to become everything we need to become and everything we need to do for the Lord. And that book, Seven Habits of Effective People, was very popular among corporate management. It had some, some, some biblical overtones, but it wasn't per se a Christian book. But it was a good book for those in management and corporate. And it sold over 40 million and it's still selling after all these years. I even went to the bookstore in our town to see if they were still available. I just kind of wanted to find out, is it, is it still selling? And, and I found out it was. It was amazing. Father, I pray that you will just speak to us today through this message that you inspired us to do. When we read your word, we become very inspired. The word of God moves us and your word changes us because it has that power the gospel is the power of god unto salvation thank you Lord. amen 1989 educator author stephen covey wrote a self-help bestseller book called seven habits highly effective people I mean, like to be highly effective people, not highly infective, <laughs> defective, or, but ineffective, very effective people. Covey says one should balance and renew one's resources, energies, and health to create a sustainable, long-term effective lifestyle. Stephen Covey passed away in July of 2012. He primarily emphasizes exercise for the physical renewal, good prayer, and good reading for the mental renewal. He also mentions service to society for spiritual renewal. The outline of his book would read as following. In the areas of personal renewal, which is number seven, going backwards, sharpen the saw. In the areas of public victory, synthesize five, seek to understand, then to be understood. That synthesize with combining elements that become greater than the sum of the elements themselves. When you combine elements of things, it becomes greater than the elements that were combined of themselves, is what he means by that word. Seek to understand, then to be understood, number five. Number four, think, win, win. In the area of private victory, number three, put first things first. We know kind of what that means in a biblical sense, we will talk about later. Number two, begin with the end in mind. That's a good 
good a habit and a good principle to live by. I like that. To begin with the end always in mind. And the number one in the list of one through seven, be proactive. That's very true. I think we have to be proactive about a lot of things about our health. Sometimes I think I have failed in that area. I think sometimes I've been pretty proactive and other times I haven't been. These seven habits, principles, do have some value. I mean, it's, it was a 25 of the most influential books written at that time. But today, I have put together my own list of habits and biblical principles, scriptural teachings that will make believers highly effective and it will sustain us in our journey of life and faith. Don't we need something to make us effective and something that will sustain, will sustain us in our everyday living? I need that desperately. Although my own list habits and biblical principles, scriptural teaching that make us effective in our journey of faith, we need those things in our lives. The following is the believer's standing, heard that the other night, an ongoing challenge they know and practice. George is teaching 1 John, and he started last Wednesday night. You need to come for that, very worthwhile. And he emphasized a, a good bit of the time 1 John, all through 1 John, it's all about knowing, knowing. The believer has a standing, and we have ongoing challenges that we can know and practice and live out those habits and principles. And what is a habit? It's a regular practice. There's good and bad, of course, but a regular practice. Something that becomes automatic. Something that becomes addictive. Wouldn't it be great if people become addictive to God? Addictive to the Word of God. Addictive in their praying. I mean, they just can't help themselves. They just, they just got to pray. Addictive in worship. They just got to worship because it's become part of their DNA. Become part of their life. And is that true for us today, that prayer has become a part of our DNA, a part of our life? Do we do it without even thinking? I think sometimes we just pray because it's part of who we are. We, we hear a gospel message. We hear a song on the radio or a song on a CD. And, it's, and it begins with worshiping and honoring God. And it don't take but a second for us just to get ourselves right into that. Because it's part of who we are. It's part of what's happened to us. It's part of what we know and part of what we practice. And it's a beautiful practice and a beautiful knowing. And I gave a little list of things of all that I could put on the one sheet of paper, front and back. That we as believers, we know and understand what it means to be born again. I think sometimes we think that's, that is such an elementary thing. But we, we've, got to, we've got to keep coming back to those elementary things that are so profound and so real. We, they, us, we know and understand what it means Jesus said, truly, truly, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature, and old things are passing away, and all things become new. Man, we know what it means to be born again. Born again. We think about, well, that's something that should be talked about to someone who's 
not saved, maybe we should have messages on born again. But we need to understand and we need to constantly embrace the majestic work of grace, the wonders of God's power that he could take a lost human being, a evil, a sinful human being, and he can, Nicodemus had a hard time understanding that. Uh, and he thought about the natural. I don't know how I can get back in my mother's womb. But it was a spiritual thing. And we know, we understand the awesomeness of what God did when he rebirthed us and brought us into his family. We're sons and daughters that have been born again. I'm here glad you're in Christ. Amen. Man. It's the safest place to be. There's no good place to be other than in Christ. As believers, some of our principles and habits that we have is we, we love the Lord and others. Very, it's very apparent how much we love others. In John 13, 35, all men will know that you are my disciples because you love one another. One rendition says, because you keep showing love, it will be clear to all men. Think about that. And we know, George, there's it is again. And there's a lot of it in 1 John as you'll come and hear uh, George teach. All men will know that you are my disciples because you love, you keep showing it. Sometimes, you ever met somebody that was supposed to be a brother or a sister, and you met them just for a little bit, and you just knew right off you're going to have to learn to love them? Some people are just lovable right off. I mean, I mean they're just teddy bear lovable right off, you know? And some people you may have to now my, one of my first churches, this lady was wild, man. She was old, and she was very out there. I mean, she was really out there. Man, she was out there. And I got back in the car, and I told Joan, that woman's going to be something else to contend with. She's going to be something else. <laughs> and she was. <laughs> But when I left that church, she was my best friend and all the people there because the Lord helped me to look past her brass and her fiery ways. And I could come to love that woman and I preached her a funeral. All men will come to know who you really are because you keep showing love to people. And you know, Jesus said, loving God and loving your neighbor are the two great commandments, is what he gave. He took ten and made two out of them, didn't he? Isn't that amazing? Now, we as believers, they and we love God's Word and the truth that's in God's Word. Oh, I, I mean, you could choose a lot of different scriptures. I just chose ones that I kind of was wanting to do. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you, David said. Jesus says, if you abide in my word and you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will not only set you free, but it will keep you free. Come on. Amen. It will set you free and keep you free both. So we know what it means to be born again, we as believers. The love for the Lord and others is very, very apparent. Believers love God and His Word. And they love God's church, a fellowship of believers. God's church is 
ordained of him and was prophetically in the mind of God, probably even before the foundation of the world, because Jesus was the lamb slain, he had to also be the chief cornerstone both before the foundation of the world. And the church is, is something that God ordained. The local church may not always live up to what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be, but the church of Jesus Christ is an amazing thing. It's made up of those unseen and those seen. Those who have gone on to be with the Lord are still part of the church. They're just the invisible church now. And we have the visible church of us that have gathered in an organized church here. But we make up the church of the living God visible and and not visible as well. The church, fellowship of believers. Believers are encouraged. Believers are encouraged, according to Hebrews 10, 24, not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. Like David, David, David Jeremiah, and I can say it the same way he said it, I had a drug problem when I was young. I was drugged to church. And we, we were just expected. My father and my mother just kind of looked at us kids and said, well, as long as you live under our roof, we go to church and you go with us. And that's not going to be for discussion. It's just the way it is. As long as we're paying the bill and we're paying for the heat and we got the roof over your head, you're going to church. That's just it. Ain't no question about it. And I didn't mind because church was a great place for me. I learned how to under, understand people, learn how, learn social intelligence, working and dealing with people. Do you know that a lot of preacher's kids, I know those get a bad rap sometimes, because they get a bad rap because they hang out with the deacon's kids. That's what they get in trouble. But anyway, uh, preacher's kids over the last number of years have made up some of the largest group of, uh, of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. And there's reasons for that. And social, social intelligence comes from their being around so many people and learning. He says, believers are encouraged not to forsake assembling together, emphasizing the importance of meeting regular to worship, to encourage and to lift up one another. Are you going to lift somebody up today? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm not feeling very strong today, but I'm going to lift somebody up with my words today. Yes. We believe in that. It's part of our habit. It's part of our DNA. And Galatians 6 2 underscores the communal, the word communal, aspects of the Christian journey. It paints a rich picture of fellowship as a vital component of the Christian experience promoting mutual support and spiritual communion and shared devotion and principles to our God. The church sometimes gets into trouble. Sometimes the church is like the ark that was saving humanity. It gets a little stinky sometimes. You know, when you're on that ark with all those animals, it got a little stinky. You know it had to be. It had to be. But so the church is a little stinky sometimes. But it's ordained of God. And it's made up of imperfect people who are just trying to serve and love God with all their hearts. And they're still in the construction. So you say, well, why is this person to act this way? Why? Do people act the way they act? Do what they do? Uh, I know it's disappointing sometimes, but we're still all under construction. God is still, through His Spirit, trying to bring us to the image of His Son. He's still working on us. He's still working in us with His grace and with His mercy and with His Holy Spirit. He's still working on us. Wow. Was another good principle in has. <coughs> God's people, 
the believer's desire to seek after God and try our best to put Him first. We want to do that. I think we desire. Sometimes we fail, but I think in the deep heart of our soul, we desire to seek after Him. We want to be a God seeker, and we want to put Him first over everything. That's really in our hearts. We struggle with it, but we want to do that, I think, most of the time. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He's near. Listen to this rendition. Seek the Lord Jehovah. And whenever you find Him, then tell Him what you need. Call on Him. Well, I love that rendition. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Matthew 6, 33. Righteously. Live righteously. And He will give you everything you ever needed. Amen. Come on. Amen. He'll give you everything you ever needed. Just put Him first. Love Him. Try to live out the righteousness that is imparted to you by God and through Christ and try to live that out. You have the righteousness of God. Try to live it out. And he'll help you to do that. He'll help you. In the back of our outline. Believers, we as believers, we love to worship and give honor and praise to the Lord. We love doing that. Psalms 84.4 They are ever praising you, O Lord. Continually, one rendition says, continually they do they praise you all day long. Come on. Amen. God's people loves to give worship and praise to God. Ever praising. Continually. God's people, the believers, the Christians, their minds and their lives are steadfast, kept in perfect peace. Is that what we need today in this crazy, mixed up world that has just gone, gone mad? Their minds, our minds as believers and lives, we want them to be steadfast and we can walk in perfect peace. Isaiah said that all those thousands of years ago. The steadfast mind thou will keep in perfect peace, a purpose sustained. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is never in vain in the Lord. Man, how beautiful that is. And then we as God's people, we're thankful. We're thankful people, I believe we are, who let the peace of Christ reign in our lives, Colossians, Paul puts it this way, let the peace of Christ, God, keep you in tune with each other. One translation. In step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing. Cultivate thankfulness. The message, the paraphrase of Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ, let God keep you in tune with each other. How many feel like we need to be in tune with each other. I heard about a mother that was at West Point there for her son's graduation and they had the march of all the hundreds of people marching in uniforms. And she looked at there and saw her son and said, isn't that strange? He's the only one that's marching in, in step. He's the only one. Well, I guess when you know your son, you'd want to thank that anyway. God wants to keep the body of Christ in tune when we're in tune with each other. Isn't that a beautiful thought? In tune. Thankful people. I will give thanks to the Lord for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever. Come on. God's people, the believers, 
a live a life with an open hand, a life of generosity. 1 Timothy 6.18, instruct them to do good, to be generous and ready to share rich and noble works, open-handed and generous hearted. Is that God's people? Yes. It's one of our habits. We just have a habit of giving, doing for others. We just do that. We don't have to even think too much about it. We just do it. It's a part of our DNA. Michael Campbell, who won the U.S. Open in 2005, it's not on your sheet there. You have to write this in. Because at the time we were typing it, I couldn't remember which U.S. Open in Pinehurst that he had won. I was there at that particular U.S. Open, 2005. Joe and I uh, were working there in that U.S. Open. Michael Campbell, who won the U.S. Open in 2005, Pinehurst, said his grandma, his grandma was a big influence in his life. And this is what his grandma told him when he was real young. He says, we are given two hands, one hand to receive, one hand to give. One hand to receive, one hand to give. That was Michael Campbell, who won the Pinehurst 2005 U.S. Open. Believers, believers like us, one of our things that we really believe, we believe that with God all things are possible. Amen. We believe God is the God of the impossible. Amen? Amen. With God all things are possible. Mark says to those who believe, Mark chapter 9, says to those who believe all things are possible. Let me tell you this. Someone has said, and listen to this, impossible, if I say impossible, is a very dangerous word. Impossible is a dangerous word. It has the destructive power of an emotional thermonuclear bomb. Impossible is a dangerous word. It has the destructive power of an emotional thermonuclear bomb. Parents have been in error when they've looked at their children and said, you're never going to amount to anything in the heat of, of passion or, or disgust about something. Don't ever tell your children they're not going to amount to anything. Tell them they're going to amount to great value and they're going to change the world. Impossible is a dangerous word, a destructive word. It cuts like a knife thrust at the heart of creativity. Impossible is a very dangerous word. We believe with God anything and all things are possible. He's God, the God of the impossible. Jesus replied, why do you say if you can? Why would you say such a thing? Anything is possible to someone who believes and has faith. That's in the chapter Mark. We didn't put that one down. Probably 921, I think it was. Believers understand the importance of positive believing and thinking instead of negative thoughts. This is an important principle and a habit that we need to make sure we have. We understand the importance of positive believing and positive thinking instead of negativity and negative thoughts. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 5 says it very clear. Casting down imaginations. One, one commentary said philosophical strongholds. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and sets itself up against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Casting down, casting out 
those negative thoughts that exalt themselves, philosophical thoughts that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Paul says the knowledge of God is greater than anything that he ever lost or possessed. It was greater. And everything in comparison to the knowledge of God was dumb. I guess you know what dumb is. I'll not use any other words. I'll stay with the Bible and won't get in trouble. <laughs> Believers long for and desire to manifest the character of God. Oh, I know it's within you. You desire the fruit of the Spirit to be manifest, which is the character growth of God, the outgrowth of God's character through us and in us. We long to manifest the character of God. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Aren't you glad that God's people have joy? Man, joy. We weren't baptized in pickle juice. We were baptized in the joy of the Holy Spirit. Peace. We need peace today. There's people in this world right now, right this moment, would give anything if they could have peace and just don't realize it comes from God. Long-suffering. Aren't you glad God's long-suffering? Otherwise, I would already be out of here. He would have wiped me out. He just, up, up, up through with you. Oh, I'm so glad for long-suffering. The gentleness of God. The goodness of the goodness of God, faith, meekness, temperance. I don't like discipline. I don't know who does. But it's part of the character of God. And it gives a lot of good that comes out of that. Again, it's just there is and doesn't need to be a law. In closing, as we get further, God's people and believers, they understand the need for prayer and the power of prayer. It's just part of it. We just, we just go and pray just at the drop of a hat. Man. We don't even have to have the hat don't even have to drop. We just we hear something that there's a concern. We just pray. We, it's part of who we are. It's our DNA. It's become a habit that we just do. We're addicted to it. Man, some people are addicted to other things. Oh, God's people is addicted to praying and believing God for things. The prayer of a righteous person. That's, that doesn't mean sinless perfection. But a righteous person whom God has made righteous. Listen, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And I love, my, I love Jeremiah 33.3. Gee, God only speaks 3,800 times in the first person. In this time of the 3,800, of one of those 3,800, he says, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things thou knowest not. We understand the power of prayer. It changes everything, including us. And two more here. As believers... They and we know they must live their lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. People have said so many times to someone who was not knowing the Lord, I know a person would say to the person trying to win them to Christ, nobody can live the Christian life. And the person who's trying to teach them to come to Christ says to them, you're right. Nobody can live a Christian life. But by the help of the Holy Spirit in us. Jesus says, I used to be with you. But there's going to come a time that the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. And He's going to be with you. And He's going to be poured out in baptism upon you. And with the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we can live out the Christian life. These things have I spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the helper, I mean, it was the Holy Spirit is called the helper. If you don't have it, it's hard to live the Christian life. You've got to have the helper. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name and teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Ah, what a powerful prayer.
principle. What a powerful habit to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Be ever filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit stimulate your soul. Be, don't be drunk. Don't be stimulated by wine. But let the Holy Spirit stimulate your soul. One rendition. And last but not least, and that's all, I would have put a few more, but I, I was running out of paper here. We understand as believers, we have a commission. We have a responsibility to share the good news of the gospel to the world. You've got the good news. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything. I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age of the world. Joe and I travel, you know, fairly often to go see our two children outside of Atlanta. And, and it always happens either to us or somebody else on the other side of the road. We're going down 85 South and all of a sudden on the other lane going north there is a backup that just keeps going. We keep going mile, miles after mile and the backup is just still there on that other lane going north. And we keep going and keep going and the backup still just keeps getting worse. And I think about that every time I see that. And sometimes we've been in the backup. And, I, and we get way on down. We know the backup's there with maybe six or eight miles of backup. And we get way on down the road. And we see people that are coming, but they don't know what they're headed towards. And you, you, you want, you'd like to have a sign that you can stick out your window. Slow down. Don't worry. It ain't going to make any difference. Because when you go a few more miles, you're going to be stopped and you have nowhere to go. You will not be able to go any further. And that, that's what we should think about people that, that don't know the Lord, that are not ready to meet the Lord. Hey, stop. Don't you know that something could happen to you any moment and you could be gone into eternity? We think about those things. That's something that's on our heart for our children for our families, for our neighbors, for people that we care about, should be part of it. Let's stand together and sing how great is our God.